Hello, hello. Greetings, everybody, from here at El Shaddai Ministries. We're very excited that today uh, we are very honored to have the organization stand with us, be here, and we have a fantastic speaker who's been to El Shaddai before. Oh, I really have said, and I do believe he's one of the best stand with us speakers, so we're glad to, uh, glad to have him back. But before I, uh, we introduce Ron, I'd like Randy and John, Michael, come on up. Randy Kessler uh, is the gentleman who's with Stand With Us, and I'd like you to just tell a little bit about Stand With Us and how they can contact you. I would be happy to. So thank you very much, Pastor Mark. I'm Randy Kessler, once again, the executive director for Stand With Us Northwest, which means I manage our activities across Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. And what Stand With Us does is two things. We support Israel through education, and we fight anti and we fight anti-Semitism, and all of our programs uh, are really built around that core mission, and it's one of the reasons why we're so pleased to partner with El Shaddai Ministries here. Um, How could people get a hold of you if they're interested in you coming to their place? By all means. So we are available to to speak to whoever is interested in learning, and there's so much to talk about. It's not just Ron Bar Yoshafat that we have as speakers but there are a number of other resources and uh, contacts that you can make. To reach me, it's northwest at standwithus.com. It's very simple, northwest at standwithus.com. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions or opportunities to help uh, achieve our mission. Let me say, please introduce, introduce to everybody John Michael and what he does with Stand With Us. All right, I'm gonna actually let John sure, Michael introduce just, himself. <clears throat> Hi everybody, my name is John Michael. I'm the Northwest High School Regional Manager for Stand With Us. So I'm in charge of the Kenneth Leventhal internship in the Northwest region, so that's about Central California up to Alaska. And I go to high schools and educate about Israel and how to combat anti-Semitism. If you would like me to come and speak to one of your classrooms in that region I just outlined, kind of all the way to Montana, uh, reach out to Stand With Us Northwest. All right, all right. and... We only have one microphone, so we're bouncing things back and forth. Uh, now I'd like uh, Randy to introduce Ron Bar Yoshafat, uh, who I think is just fantastic. I gave a huge introduction about him a couple of weeks ago when I announced that he was coming, the full bio and everything. Uh, he's incredible, but we'll let Randy get the details. Okay. So uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce my friend Ron Bar Yoshafat. Ron uh, has a fascinating history as a warrior for Israel and for the Jewish people. And some of that warrior mentality actually was evident earlier in his life when he was the national mixed martial arts champion of Israel in 1999 and 2000. In his army service, he was a member of the combat special forces in the Israeli defense forces. And he still serves one to two years, I'm sorry, one to two months per year in combat special forces reserves. So. When you hear about stuff going down in the Judea and Samaria area or other things where Israel has to come and take a strong security posture, Ron has been one of those people on the ground taking that and, and making it his own fight. Now he fights less with a gun and more with his mouth. Uh, by really advocating on behalf of Israel and educating it about Israel in any forum that he can. Much of his education is done on Israeli television. And so he's quite a well-known name in Israel. Um, but let's go ahead and, and have him talk to you. So uh, his background is, uh, as you can see up on the screen, very, very, very educated. So Ron got a JD, a, law, a legal degree from Hebrew University and is a practicing, uh, a, a, not a practicing attorney, but a licensed attorney in Israel. He also got a, a degree in political science and he, a degree in history and he's working on his PhD in history right now. So let's take everything we've got and put our hands together for Ron Bar Yeshiva. <laughs> okay. And uh, I just have one more thing. And I think you'll appreciate it. I told him I want it no holes barred. Right. How many of you guys want that? Yeah. Amen. All right, thank you very much. I hope that after this uh, great introduction, I will not disappoint anyone. All right, so um, um, basically, Pastor Mark said I can talk about whatever I want. So I have many things I want to talk about. 
Um, I also want you guys to understand how I see Israel, also to understand the Israeli system, how it works, because I think usually people have no idea how, we have a different system, okay? We don't have a presidential system, we have a parliamentary system, and I want people to learn how the Israeli democracy works, and maybe it will also help people understand what is going on in the Middle East and why we sometimes have all these troubles uh, when sometimes you think the solution could be so, so simple and it doesn't happen. So I I'm going to start with this. Israel is a parliamentary democracy, which means that our Congress, the parliament, is called the Knesset. The government is made up of the coalition. So you have, in Israel, many parties. In America, you have two, sometimes three or four, but you have two major parties. In Israel, when people are running for election, you can have 40 different parties running for 120 seats. That is a different type of uh, mechanism that we have to deal with. Which means, you know, we say in a democracy you have to have an election once every four years. In Israel, we have four elections in one year. So <laughs> we need to deal with that. Um, and when you have uh, sometimes this uh, uh, uncertainty in what's going to happen with the government, you understand that it's very difficult to promote certain policies. Um, we don't have a constitution in Israel. I'm a big supporter of a constitution, but we don't have one yet. I am very optimistic. I hope that we will have one in the future. There aren't that many countries in the world, liberal democracies, that don't have a constitution. Israel and England uh, are the two most known examples. Um, we are in the Middle East. It's a whole different neighborhood. People sometimes don't understand this. When you're living in the Middle East, it's a different, not just climate, it's a different mentality, and it's a different neighbors that we have to deal with. We also have in Israel a very big minority. We have a 20% Arab minority. There aren't that many countries in the world that have a 20% Arab Muslim minority uh, that are able to sustain the stability. It's very unique. You have Muslim countries that are stable, but usually when you have a westernized country with such a big percentage of minorities, that makes the country become a lot less stable. So it's quite remarkable that Israel is able to stay so stable. Um, and we're the only Jewish state in the world, and people sometimes uh, forget about it. And when I say a Jewish state, we're not a theocracy. Um, the vast majority of Jews living in Israel are not observant Jews. They are very proud of their Jewish identity, but they're not cons they would not consider themselves religious. Um, so this is the framework I want to uh, start with, and I want to compare it to what we have in America. I would argue that in America, if you want to know where someone stands politically, you ask them two questions. How much do you want the government in your pocket? and how much you want the government in your values. If someone says that they don't want the government in their pocket or in their values, they are what you would call a libertarian. If people want the government in their pocket and in their values, they would be called an authoritarian. If they want the government in their pocket, meaning a redistribution of wealth, but they don't want the government in their values, they would usually align, they will be aligned with the Democratic Party. And if they want the government in their values but not in their pocket, usually they would be aligned with the Republican Party. And if they have no opinion, uh, they'll be in the center. No, I'm joking. If, they have, uh, if they're not very solid about each one and any one of those. I would also argue that today you see a shift. You see that in the left side of the political map, it's not anymore don't tell us what to do with our values. It's actually we're going to tell you what to do with our values. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if they were worried in the past about um, religious morality being imposed by the government, now basically they just have a different set of morality that they wish to impose. It can be with, um, also, I'm not going to give all the examples, but I'm sure that you can uh, understand what I'm referring to. And basically they're taking it from don't interfere, they're taking it to the authoritarian level. Basically they are taking, I would argue, they're taking individual freedoms. Um, I, in, in my opinion, sometimes the American right, instead of combating that, they're saying, so we're just going to go to the libertarian side. Let's just decide that the government doesn't, um, doesn't do anything about it. Uh, I have to be honest, I'm a conservative. Um, I do think that I believe in nation states. I believe that countries have a saying. Um, I think that people don't come together just because of working traffic lights and clean streets. People come together because they have something that connects them as a people. And they want to have certain values where they live. And I think that that's not just natural, because that's all over the world. It's also a morally just thing. That's how societies are built. Um, but after saying about, I'm not here to talk to you about America. I'm here to talk to you about Israel. But I just wanted to show the American model and then compare it to the Israeli model. Up until about 10 years ago, we had three lines of thought in Israel. 
one line was the security line. Do you want Israel to have more control in Judea and Samaria or less? Do you want Israel to go for a peace treaty or to hold a, a stronger stance on security? How would you react to an act of terror? Would you use a lot of force or are you going to contain it? So that's one X. Are you more right wing or left wing on that? Another X that we had is the economic X, which is kind of similar to the American, even though I have to say I, I believe in free market. I'm a haunted minority in Israel. Um, Israel, not judging, but when it was created, it was created as more of a socialist state. And I am trying to push it slowly to be a more free market state. Um, so that's also a political discourse that you have. And you have an identity X, meaning should Israel be a falafel uh, selling America? Or should it be the nation state of the Jewish people with Jewish characteristics? Um, so also we have a line here between right and left. Me, again, as a conservative, yes, I think Israel should have Jewish characteristics. It's part of my identity. So when you have three different lines of thought, it means that it's a little bit more complex system, which might explain why we have 40 parties. Because you can be right wing when it comes to security issues and left wing when it comes to economic issues or vice versa. Or you can be a party that says, I'm only focusing on the identity of the state. And you can make all these different combinations. That was true to about a decade ago. You can say, Iran, but you have other issues in Israel, just like you have other issues in America. You have all these other topics that people are now talking about and they're trying to shove it into politics. I'm not ignoring them. They exist. But that's not a line of thought. And I'll try to explain. Let's say if we'll take the concept of feminism. And in Israel, someone will establish a feminist party. And all the women in Israel will vote for that party. And also some of the guys. And they have, so I said in Israel, we have 120 seats. So they have 70 seats in the parliament. OK, but the problem is that you have women who are right wing, and you have women who are left wing. Because the fact that someone is male or female, that's not their whole identity. It's just a part of their identity. So that doesn't make any sense. So are you going on a peace deal, or are you going to uh, implement the Israeli law over Judea and Samaria? Should Israel have the Star of David on its flag or not? Just because someone is a woman doesn't make that, like it's, it's, it's an identity, but it's not the only part of your identity. Same for people who are vegan. OK, you have 100 members of Knesset that are vegan. OK, what do you do next? What, what are your economic policies? And I can go on and go uh, and continue with this, but you get the point. These are topics. I'm not ignoring them. They, they, people vote on these issues, but they're not lines of thought. The lines of thought that we have in Israel were the three lines that I mentioned before. We have two more axes that exist in Israel today. Very heated debate. Not exactly like what you have in America now, but I think it's crucial for you to understand because that's what people in Israel are talking about. One of them is, are you pro-Netanyahu or anti-Netanyahu? It's a split in the middle. I'm sure you cannot imagine having a head of state that will split the country in the middle. Um, but we also have this in Israel. I'm sure you can never imagine the media being super against the person when he was running the state. But I would argue uh, that the, most of the media in Israel is extremely anti-Netanyahu. Right now, there is a trial against Netanyahu. Uh, I, I am going to put my opinion. My opinion is that I, I am not even sure what he's being accused of. But OK, put that aside. So it's a split in the middle. Are you supporting Netanyahu or are you not supporting Netanyahu? And that causes another split, split if you're right wing or left wing. However, it doesn't exactly matches with the political science of things. Because some people who support Netanyahu are left wing economically. Or some people who are opposing Netanyahu can say we're very right wing when it comes to security. So it's very, very strange this uh, another axe of thought that enters. The last one that we have now in Israel is about judicial activism. Here is where it's very interesting. I would argue that me, I'm, I'm again, conservative. I want to restrict judicial activism in Israel. I think that even an American left winger would, would stand next to me because the judicial activism in Israel is, is beyond what you can imagine. Basically, the, the, the system in a democracy is supposed to be that you have people. The people vote for their representatives. You have the government. And you have the Supreme Court. I'm sure you've all heard of the Federalist Papers. The courts don't have a sword, and they don't have a wallet. right? That's the Federalist Papers, um, which I'm a big fan of. We don't have, unfortunately, yet a Federalist paper in Israel. In Israel, they kind of shifted the triangle. So they have the Supreme Court, the government, and the legislative branch. And the way I see it, that is not democracy. Because I don't want a council of a few people, very smart, Supreme Court judges. But sometimes, some might argue that they're 
um, tilted to one political side, <laughs> left, and uh, because, of, because of that, sometimes you feel like they're not representing really the values of the people. So that's a very, very heated debate in Israel, which basically asks the following question. Who do you think should have the final decision? Should it be the people you elect, or should it be bureaucrats? And I believe it should be the people that, uh, that do this. And it's also a very, very split middle decision. If you think it's the uh, elected representatives, you'd consider to be a right wing. And you think, if you think that the uh, uh, bureaucrats will uh, defend democracy, then you're tilted to the left. I hope that that was a, uh, a good explanation of how the Israeli system works. We have, again, an ele election now. Um, I have no idea what the outcome would be. I think no one in Israel will tell you what the outcome would be, because we are really close tie in the middle. And unlike the American system, where the winner takes all, in the Israeli system, you have to build a coalition. And it's a split in the middle, 60-60. The main axis of all of these axes of thought, uh, economy, security, uh, uh, identity, the main axis are you with or without Netanyahu. And right now, Netanyahu is uh, on the border of establishing a very narrow coalition. Um, if he fails to succeed, doesn't mean that the other side will be able to create a coalition. We are in a lockdown of political, uh, uh, it's like a turmoil of, of political elections. We're just, we're having an one after the other after the other. Uh, which, by the way, we see that we can still sometimes manage without the government, which is also very interesting. <laughs> um, which may be, may be a very good lesson for the Israelis. All right, from this, I want to talk a little bit about security issues. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we are in the Middle East. We don't have an ocean to our side, you know, both our sides, um, or Canada in our north border. Not, God forbid, I'm not saying anything against Canada, but I don't think people are threatened by Canada. We are surrounded by proxies of Iran. We have to the north of us the, a very strong proxy, Hezbollah. Uh, Hezbollah, they said, for those who do not know, they're a Shiite uh, organization. If you don't know, in Islam, you have several denominations, the two biggest ones, the Shi'i and the Sunni. Um, so it's very interesting. They only have one thing in common, and that is their hatred to Israel. So in the north, I have a Shi'i terrorist organization, well-trained, funded by um, Iran. And originally, when Hezbollah was created, they said, we want to take Israel outside of Lebanon. Well, there are no Israelis in Lebanon. No Israeli lives there. And for some reason, Hamas, uh, sorry, Hezbollah is just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Just so we'll be on the same page in case you don't know the demography. In Israel, we have about 9 million citizens. It's a very small place. Um, right now, as we speak, you have hundreds of thousands of rockets that Hezbollah holds. That they can fire at any minute towards Israel. Hundreds of thousands of rockets to a state, a country, that has 9 million people living there. So that's how I start my morning. That's, that's Lebanon. To the east of it, I have uh, uh, another wonderful country. I'm being sarcastic. I have Syria. Syria, under the Assad regime. Assad has killed more than um, half a million people of his own nation, of the Syrian people. It's also being funded by Iran. Syria and Lebanon are very, very unique in the sense that they're not um, countries with a, a long history. They're a very new country. Um, Israel is reestablished. I'll argue about that later. But they're very new countries, and they don't have a very strong concept of nationality because they're made up of different groups. So it's interesting to see that in Syria, the minority is controlling all of the other groups. And imagine that they became a dictatorship. Um, I also have um, Egypt in the south of me. Egypt has a peace treaty with Israel. It's a very, very cold peace. Um, when, I when in Egypt, as you know, they had uh, uh, what they thought was going to be the Arab Spring, which became the Muslim winter. They had a, a short time with the Muslim Brotherhood controlling Egypt, which was really an interesting question to what's going to happen with that and the peace deal with Israel, which means the peace that Israel and Egypt have is a very fragile peace agreement. The people who live in Egypt are not big fans of Israelis. And I want to point something out. I'm a super hawkish Israeli. I have no problem with anyone around me in the Middle East. I have no hatred to any one of the people there. I would love to have peace with them. I don't hate anyone. I hate the, the governments that they have because they're trying to annihilate me. But I have no hatred in my heart, not for the people of Morocco, not for the people of Egypt, not for the people of Syria or Lebanon. 
And it's very interesting and it's very sad to know that the people in the public in Egypt, they're being indoctrinated to hate me. I also have, obviously, the main problem right now, which is Iran. Iran, but I want to say something here. Iran is not a problem to Israel. Iran is a problem to America. Iran is a problem to Europe. And I'm always surprised that people don't understand this. So Iran are saying the following. They're saying, we want to have nuclear capacity because we want to have better energy. They, they went green, I guess. Now they want to have green energy. I don't know. So the country that has almost the biggest amount of oil supply in the world is willing to absorb sanctions from the world to make her, their own people live in poverty because they want to have nuclear energy. You think that their real aim is Israel? We're little Satan. America is big Satan. We're just uh, the playground to see if it works. Once they have nuclear capacity, they can put it in the suitcase, go with a boat to America, and create real damage here. Once they have nuclear capacity, they can fire not at Israel, that's obvious, they can fire all over Europe. And I'm sure the world is going to react in a very, very severe way, just they're, like they're doing right now when uh, Russia and Ukraine are having their conflict. Um, so that's another issue that we have. I want to share something funny that happened to me two years ago. I was in a panel. I was representing the Israeli right, and to, to the left of me was someone who was representing the Israeli left. And I told them, I have nothing against Arabs. I would love to have a peace deal with Dubai. I would love to have a peace deal with the Emirates. And he said, how could you ever have a peace deal with these countries when you don't have a peace deal with your neighbors? And I told him, because these countries have a real identity. The Arabs that live amongst me, their only identity is to hate me. A year passed, and Israel signed the Abrahamic Accords. So right now, we do have a peace deal. And my, my wish uh, came true, and we do have a peace treaty with these countries. And I think it's wonderful. And I wish we'll have more of that, hopefully with Saudi Arabia also. Because um, I think that will bring stability to the Middle East. On the other hand, um, I have zero desire for a peace with the Arabs in Judea and Samaria and Gaza. And I will come to that in a few minutes. To the east of Israel, we have Jordan. Jordan, which is, <coughs> sorry, but it's also part of a made-up uh, country. They exist now, and I, have, I respect their sovereignty. But basically, they're sitting on a part that was originally promised to the Jewish people, the eastern side of the Jordan uh, Valley. Today, people call Judea and Samaria the West Bank. Now, if you look at a map, wherever I stand in Israel, it's always to the east of me, because it's the east side of Israel. It's only west of Jordan. It was coined when uh, Jordan illegally occupied Judea and Samaria between 1947 to 1967. Um, and they're not uh, extremely hostile towards Israel, but they're not big fans of us. So that's my neighborhood. That's where I live. I also have Turkey, which is a big country with a lot of influence in the, in the region. It's also another big supporter of Israel. I have other Arab and Muslim countries surrounding me. Um, but hopefully, in the near future, Israel will have more, more peace deals with other countries. I'm going to continue and zoom in to what's happening in Israel. I don't know if you remember, but you once had a president called Trump. Um, the conservatives in Israel really liked Trump for many things. One, he recognized the Golan Heights as part of Israel. And the second thing is that he had the, well, actually three things. He also moved the embassy, which I think was very, very nice, because uh, and I, I'm not because I'm not an American, you know, uh, Pastor Mark told me not to hold back. I'm not an American citizen, so I, I'm not going to comment too much about your, uh, your politics. But I can say as an Israeli, I really appreciated the fact that he did a few things for, uh, for Israel. The second was moving the embassy. And the, the third was the Pompeo Doctrine, which basically said, uh, yeah, Jews are from Judea. So <laughs> it's always funny to me that the, the crime, the people uh, in the world are accusing Jews because they're saying, well, you're building in Judea. I'm like, yeah. So you're saying my war crime is that someone, you know, build a balcony. OK, very interesting. So the Pompeo Doctrine basically said that Jews have a right to be in Judea. And it's very interesting. I know that you guys, uh, my audience is, is an uh, intelligent audience, and they know the history. We're actually all part of Israel. We're called Jews because the last tribe that was kicked out of the land of Israel was the tribe of Judea. You have Jews who are actually not from the tribe of Judea, Jews from Jerba, from uh, uh, Tunisia, Jews from uh, Georgia, from, uh, from Yemen, Jews from Ethiopia. We call them Jews, but actually they're from a different tribe. We had tri 12 tribes, as you all know. We're all sons of Israel. And was, when Israel was reestablished, they actually tried to think what should be the proper name. 
Some say leave the, the original name that was there in the, in the region. Some say let's call it Judea. And some said, no, we need to call it Israel. Because Israel consists of the 12 tribes. And some people that we call Jews today, they're actually not from the tribe of Judea. But it is remarkable to say, well, why are Jews building in Judea? Well, Jews are building in Judea because Jews are from Judea. That, how do you know it? From the name, Jews, from Judea. That, that's how I know where I'm from. And I, I really think it's wrong. So people are saying, oh, you're all European colonialists. I'm like, no, I'm indigenous. How do you know? From my name. Do you know where Arabs are from? Arabs are from Arabia. Saudi Arabia, that's where they're from. That's how it works. Um, so we're very uh, grateful for the uh, Pompeo Doctrine, which basically acknowledged the fact that um, the Jews have a right also for Judea. Um, and it's interesting to see what did the Israeli think about it. So the left in Israel, they were against it. The left in Israel wants a two-state solution. Um, I have a feeling that if all the Arabs living in Israel, Andrew Dan Samir in Gaza would say, you know what, we want to move to Canada, the Israeli left will say, no, no, you're ruining my dream of a two-state solution. Like they're so fixated on that that they're unable to see, well, maybe that we have other solution. The far right was also not very happy with the plan to implement part of the law of Andrew Dan Samir because they said, well, why part of the land? If you're doing it on part of the land, some might think that you're giving up uh, on other parts. And I think most Israelis were supporting and confused by what was happen happening with uh, Trump's plan. But you know, as I mentioned, in Israel, uh, one year for elections, that didn't come through, and also a different uh, presidency in, uh, in the States right now. Um, the legal status of Judea and Samaria, as I said, some people say it's the crime of Jews for living and building in Judea and Samaria. And people are arguing against it. And they're saying it's someone else's land. They're saying it's illegal according to international law and against the Oslo Accords. They're saying that we're using someone else's resources, and it's, it's against peace. Now, I don't know if you know this map. I'm a really, I'm not a big fan of this map, to say the least. First of all, my hometown, Ramat Sharon, which was built in 1922, appears here as, uh, as part of the green territory, which is really annoying. Um, that's one lie. The second lie, this is a schnitzel looking shape of a country, OK? <laughs> that's not. That's not what we were hoping to get. That's not the biblical land of Israel. That's what we got after the Brits gave 70% of what was promised to us to the Jordanians. And then we had a partition plan. And then we had the independence war. And then we had the Six Day War. And we quadrupled ourselves. And then we had peace treaties and more wars and more peace. And at the end of it, we got to this schnitzel looking shape of a country. And the Arabs of Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but I do not use the P word. For me, it's important. Term terminology is important to me because I care about truth. And I think that there are lies in this world. And one of these lies is this map, that there was an entity that the Arabs in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, they had a state. And I, it's so easy to diffuse. OK, so when was it established? Yeah. Who was the prime minister? What currency did they use? Can you give me? I'll give you all the content of my wallet if you can answer any of these questions. The answer, you would not be able to because it was not created at that time. So I, I try not to use the P word. Um, and, and literally, that's part of what I, uh, I try to do. So I say they don't, they don't really have a narrative. They have a negative, meaning they're looking at the Zionist story, the love story between the Jewish people and their land. And they're copy pasting it and saying, oh, yeah, that's ours. And that's why I would argue that I don't want to have peace with them, because I cannot have peace with someone that says, my whole identity is for you to not exist. This is the city of Tel Aviv. This is the city of Tel Aviv 100 years ago. Sometimes people say, yeah, the colonial European Jews that came after the Holocaust, I'm sure they were extremely strong and powerful. The European colonial Jews came to a, a built country and deported all of the Arabs. No, this was Tel Aviv then. This is Tel Aviv now. Israel is doing fantastic. Um, I'll tell you something interesting about Israel. In California, correct me if I'm wrong, there's the lowest birth rate in America, 1.1. When they ask people, how come you have so few kids? They said, self-fulfillment. In Tel Aviv, the secular Tel Avivian woman has the average of three kids. They asked her, how come you have so many kids? You know what she said? Self-fulfillment. 
it's a different way to understand the world. Again, I'm conservative. Unfortunately, I have not met one, my wife yet, but I do believe that that's how it works. You have a man and a woman that have a family, they have kids, you're part of the community, you're part of a country. I think it's natural, good, and healthy. So this is Tel Aviv. We took the desert and we made it into an amazing high-tech nation because while the other side is only focusing on damaging us, and I'm going to say something very hard, harsh, but again, Pastor Mark said I, I don't need to hold anything back. Israel has developed so many things that makes our life better in the medicine field, in technology, in the high-tech, in whatever you name it. My Arab neighbors, the only thing that they have created are different ways to murder people. They took balloons and made it into a weapon. I don't know if you noticed, they're taking balloons from the Gaza Strip, putting explosives on them and sending them to the town of Zderot in the, in the south of Israel. So kids who are naive, they see a balloon, they'll go to it and they will explode. Can you imagine having your kids today looking at a balloon and running away from it because they think it might explode on them? That's horrific. Tunnels. People build tunnels to have subways, to have good tra transportation. In Gaza, they have, the, they have a, an underground city. The whole underground city, I'm talking about tens of thousands of miles of underground tunnels. They could have used that money to do this, to build a high-tech uh, city. Instead of that, they have a tunnel of terror. In case you don't know, in 2005, Israel left Gaza. Israel had the disengagement. I'm very much against it, but that's what Israel decided. Israel left Gaza, but Gaza never left Israel. They said not only are they going to build tunnels for themselves, for terror tunnels to shoot rockets at Israel from there, but they're building tunnels from Gaza into Israel. Imagine that now, well, unfortunately, actually, you don't have to imagine, because you have this in America now as well. This is what they import. You have tunnels from Mexico penetrating into America. That's not what sovereign states should accept. I'm very much against that. Again, I got the permission from uh, Pastor Mark to say. Um, but I, I want to show you. Uh, it's, re it's really funny, because I, I, I want to share a story. I have, uh, I have a left-wing friend, and we were talking about um, policies in America. Again, I'm not an American citizen. It's not what the lecture is about. But she's an American. She's an American Israeli. And she said, I don't believe in borders. And I said, all right. Do you think everyone should come to the States? I have a great appreciation, for, great appreciation for America. Again, I love the founding fathers. I love the concept of America. I have no desires to become an American. My one true love is Israel. <laughs> Saying that, I appreciate America. And, and she says, I think everyone should come to America. I was like, everyone, everyone. No limitation, no limitation. I was like, OK. I told her, have you ever heard of this country called China? And he's like, yeah. I was like, Do you know how many people live in China? I was like, mm, a little bit over a billion. I was like, OK. So if 300 million Chinese just decide they want to come to America, you think that that's fine. It should not be any problem. I was like, oh. I was like, OK. So because if 300 million Chinese come to America, and then you have an election, they can vote on whoever they want, and maybe it'll just be a part of China. And that's it. Just destroy America, because you don't have a border. It's very natural for a country to have a border. That's just in parentheses, giving my, my two cents on how I feel. I am very pro-borders for every country. I think that's what makes countries countries. Because otherwise, it's just a big mesh mesh. Um, I want to show you something. This, I, I told you, I, I usually don't use the P word. I am going to use it here, because it's in the right context. This is the American League for a Free Palestine. This is from one century ago. You know what this is? This is a list of Jews who are asking to give the land of Israel back to the Jews from the Brits. It's amazing to me to see how a word has shifted, shifted so much from saying, of course, when we're referring to Jews, they used the P word, because that's what the Romans named it after they kicked all of the Jews out of the land of Israel. And Arabs were called Arabs, because that's what it was. And you can see it in different symbols. I don't know if you've heard of the Jerusalem Post. It's, it's an Israeli newspaper that's in English. The original name was the Palestine Post. They changed the name in 1951. Israel was created in 1948. They changed the name in 51 because the owner wanted to move to Tel Aviv, and the chief editor wanted to stay in Jerusalem. So they split, and they said, let's change the name. Um, the Anglo-Palestine Bank, it was the bank that was created by the Zionist organization. The flag of the area that was at that time was called with the P word. You can see that it looks much similar 
to the Israeli flag than to whatever they have now. And again, if you think about it, this is the land of Israel. The Turks, the Ottoman Empire, took part of it and didn't allow Jews to, to live there, basically. The British uh, Empire got a mandate that was supposed to give it to the Jews to build a state for, for them. They gave 70% of what was promised to the Jews to what is today Jordan, because the Hashemite kingdom helped them fight the Ottomans. Then we had a United Nations partition plan. So out of the 30% that was left to the Jews, they wanted to take 50%. So 50% out of 30% that left the Jews with one five, 15% of the land that was promised. The Jews said yes, because we were not as powerful as people like to sometimes claim, which is a little bit ridiculous. After the, the catastrophe of the Holocaust, Jews just said, just give us a place to be again. We need a homeland. Um, the, the Jews said yes, the Arabs rejected and started a war, and the aim of that war was to annihilate the Jewish people. But we prevailed, and we won that war. Later, another time, all of the Arab countries around us, five countries and help from other countries, tried to annihilate Israel, but Israel again prevailed and quadrupled its size. So now we're looking at a three times bigger than the original size of, of the partition plan. But Israel seeked peace and gave that land in hope for peace. I, again, my personal note, I would not support that, but that was the, the government's decision. And now you're looking at this map, this map that tries to pretend as if the Jews has stolen someone else's land. And I'm saying that's just preposterous. It's not a narrative, it's a negative. And that is why I do not even aspire to have peace with people that say their identity is the death of me. And I cannot, I cannot meet them halfway. Um, sometimes people accuse Jews of coming from Europe. By the way, I don't know if you know, but in Israel, 50% of the population is, is not Ashkenazi, it's not European. You have Jews from Morocco, you have Jews from Yemen, you have Jews from, uh, from all over the world. It's actually very diverse. It's a very, very diverse country. Um, for Jews and for Arabs, you can know a lot about them from their last name. For instance, my last name is Bar Yoshafat. Bar in Hebrew means Ben, Yoshafat means Jehoshaphat. I am certain that the audience knows a little bit about the Bible. Jehoshaphat was God's favorite uh, king. So that's, that's, that's what my name means. Ran means happy. I'm a happy son of the favorite uh, king of God. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know where I'm from. I'm pretty sure that I know that I'm indigenous to the land of Israel. Also, you can do this with Arabs. When someone is named El Mesri, it means that he's coming from Egypt. If someone is named El Khorani, it means that he's coming from Syria. If someone is named is El Araki, it means he's coming from Iraq, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's when, when I uh, was trying to refer to the, the arguments and people are saying that it's someone else's land. I hope I was able to, to prove that it's not someone else's land. Next, I want to say, a lot of time I hear this, people are saying, well, Israel is violating international law. I'm an attorney. I wrote several policy uh, papers uh, about the UN. I know a thing or two about international law. So I ask them, what law are we breaking? When you're saying we're violating international law, which law? So let's talk about the sources of international law. You have five sources for international law. I don't think that there's a dispute about this in the academic world. Unlike many things I've said where I'm a minority opinion. Here, I think this is very acceptable. The main thing for international law is agreements and treaties. You have one country, you have another country, so it's bilateral, or you can have several countries, and they sign a treaty. We think about it usually in context of war and peace, but it can also be um, a trade treaty. It can also be an agreement of airfare and stuff like that. So that's agreements and treaties. That's the first source for international law. The second is customs. The most known example of customs is when Norway uses a different area to fish, where if you would look at it from the side, you'd say, is that your territory? The Norwegian would say, you know what? We've done this for 300 years. That's where we fish. That, that's fine. Also acceptable. These are, and I'm saying this by order. It has a meaning, the order that I'm presenting it, because this is how important uh, it is. Agreements come before customs, and customs come before legal principles, verdicts and scholars, and universal justice. So these are the sources of international law. The Oslo Accords, for those who do not know or are too young to remember, the Oslo Accords, I call it the Oslo War, um, was when Israel first made any sort of agreement with the PA. And in these agreements, no one, no one wrote in these agreements the Jews are not allowed to live in Judea and Samaria. 
The agreements were that Israel would withdraw from 500 uh, villages in the major cities and will give the municipality and the security um, um, responsibility for the PA. It was the first time ever that the Arabs controlled themselves in that area since the dawn of history. Um, continuing a little bit about uh, another, piece, another piece of uh, information that people sometimes don't know, it's called the Uti Posidides Juris. Basically, this rule applies to everywhere in the world apart from Israel. For some reason, and I don't know if you know, but in international law, it's OK that you have exceptions, but it's a little bit odd that the only exception is Israel. And you have other disputed areas in the world. But this rule does not apply only in Israel. What does that mean? It means that the borders of a state are the borders of the entity that was there before. Meaning, um, if the division between Russia and the Ukraine are as they are right now, it's because when you had the former Soviet Union, these were the borders. And when they left, the borders remain. You want stability. We have a lot of countries in the planet today. There are very few territories that you don't have some sort of a, a claim to the territory for a certain country. You have a little bit in the Antarctic, Antarctica. Um, and you have disputed territory, the Karabakh, uh, northern Cyprus, Western Sahara, you have disputed territory. But every country says, this belongs to me, this belongs to you. But the interesting thing is that only for Israel, they're saying this rule that sets the border, we don't accept it. So it means that when the British mandate was over, that territory was meant to be given, all of it, to the land of Israel. What happened? Short history reminder, I said it before. Jordan illegally took over Judea and Samaria, renaming it, calling it the West Bank. So by the way, if you want to help me be a happier person, to the Arabs of Judea and Samaria and Gaza, you just call them Arabs. And for uh, what some people refer to as West Bank, you call it Judea and Samaria, because that's, that's the name. Another thing that sometimes people say, they say, well, you know what? You're violating the Fourth Geneva Convention. So again, I just happen to know a little bit about International law, the Fourth Geneva Convention, Article 49, Clause 6, says the following. The occupying power, let's say Israel is occupying power, shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. For the sake of our argument, we say Israel occupied Judea and Samaria. Well, the, the only problem with this is that Israel does not forcefully transfer or deport people they go there because they want to live there, because that's where they're from. By the way, in case people don't know, Jews lived in Judea and Samaria prior to the reestablishment of the State of Israel. They were ethnically cleansed when Jordan illegally conquered that territory. So people can say, well, you know what, Ron? Maybe Israel is not deporting Jews on trucks, putting them in Judea and Samaria, but they're, like, they're encouraging them because it's cheaper to live there. Well, first of all, if that was the best place to live, then Everyone would have moved there. But I can think of other places that are cheap. Every place, every country in the world, if you live in the periphery, it's usually cheaper housing than the main cities, number one. Number two, there are a lot of problems when you live there. You're being attacked many times by the Arabs around you. You have really bad infrastructures. That's, uh, so so I, no, I don't think that, that just because we're not transferred in by cars or by, by uh, trains or, or buses, we're um, supporting that so much. No, they're doing it by their own choice. Second of all, even if that was the case, I'm an attorney, sorry, that's not, not what you sign up for. That's not what's written here. And how do I know? Because in the same article, Article 49 for the Fourth Geneva Convention, Clause 1, it says individual or mass forcible transfers, as well as the deportation of protected persons from occupied territory to the territory of the occupying power or to that of any other country are prohibited regardless of their motives. In plain English, um, what Israel is not allowed to do is to take people from Arab people from Judea and Samaria and move them to Tel Aviv. No one is claiming that Israel is doing that. So that is uh, besides the point. And you can see that in the same article, they chose to use the word individual in clause one. They chose to not take the word, to not have the word individual in clause six. They did it intentionally. The people who wrote the fourth Geneva Convention said many times it has no implication for, um, for Judea and Samaria. Um, resolution 242 of the Security Council, for those who do not know, 
there are two main differences between the League of Nations, which was the international body that prior to the UN, and the UN. The two main differences, differences are America and America. <laughs> but what do I mean by America and America? America by its fundings and America because now the Security Council under Chapter 7 actually gives the UN teeth. It gives them some power. The League of Nations was just people talking, basically people in Europe in suits talking and saying what is happening. Once America stepped into the door, they also have power to do stuff. Um, Resolution 242 calls for Israel to withdraw from territories in negotiation and so on and so forth. Two problems. Number one, um, translation. Does Israel has to withdraw from all the territories or just from parts of it? Second thing, it needs to be with a negotiation between the two sides. Um, by the way, 1967, that's a very interesting year. Why is it a very interesting year? For those who do not know, the PLO, the terrorist organization PLO, was created in 1964. In 1964, I'm sorry this is also a history lesson, but I like history, what can I do? In 1964, Israel had no control over Judea and Samaria and no control over Gaza. In 1964, Gaza was under Egyptian martial law yeah. and Judea and Samaria was under illegal Jordanian occupation. So what was the PLO saying? The PLO were saying we want to annihilate Israel. That's their article one, two, and three, and they have not changed that. Um, so I just had to, put, to point it out because of the, the years. So it means in a negotiation, Israel might have to withdraw. Um, I don't see any, any uh, hand from the other side right now. Usually when you have a negotiation, I think even the left in Israel, by the way, understand this today. The, the Israeli left is saying basically we need to try and do more, but I believe that the vast, vast majority of the Israeli left are saying, look, we have no partner right now. We have the head of the PA who was democratically elected 14 years ago. Um, and did not had an, had an election since then. And to be honest, the only reason, reason why Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen is still controlling the PA in Judea and Samaria, do you know why that is? It's because of the IDF. Yeah, exactly. It's because of the IDF. I, you know how I know? Because I serve every year between one to two months, as Randy said. I think in the past decade, I, um, I spend a year of my life during Army Reserves. And sometimes I'm being sent to a mission in Judea and Samaria, and the PA is saying, we need you to help us arrest some uh, terrorists there from Hamas. If the IDF was not there, they would butcher each other just like they did in Gaza. When Israel withdrew from Gaza, for those who did not remember, in 2005, I remember the articles. They said, Gaza is going to be Singapore. It's going to be an amazing place. Israelis would go there to eat hummus, and we will all have peace, which is very nice in theory. But what happened is that Israel withdrew from Gaza, and then Hamas took the PA and threw people from rooftops yeah. or burned them alive. And the world did not care, because that's Arab and Arab terror. Um, and Israelis are not eating hummus at Gaza. What Israelis are doing is they're, they're running from, uh, from the rockets into bomb shelters. More than 25,000 rockets were fired from Gaza into Israel. Can you imagine if they would take all this energy and invest it in creating a normal society instead of doing it for terror? The Green Line also, uh, sometimes people uh, think that the Green Line is a border. The, the peace treaty between, sorry, not the peace treaty, the armistice line between Israel and Jordan literally says this is not the border. Both sides said this is not the border. When Israel signed the peace treaty with Jordan, Jordan said we have no claims whatsoever towards Judea and Samaria. So if you look back at the Uti Pusididis Juris, the British mandate leaving, supposing to give this land to the Jews, Jordan are saying, we don't have any claim. We know that we illegally occupied it. We have a peace treaty now. Why is it that people still think that Jews living in Judea is a crime? Um, why don't I call the Arabs of Judea and Samaria anything else but Arabs? Um, they said no to a deal. It's very interesting. I cannot think, maybe I'm wrong. Feel free to correct me. I cannot think of any other group in history that had refused a deal. If they're saying that they have the aspiration for national liberation, they should have said yes many times ago. They should have said yes. They had a bazillion of different chances. We, the Jews, we said yes to 15% of the land that was promised to us. If the Kurds would have received an offer, someone would say, I'll give you 50% of Kurdistan, would you take liberation? I have no doubt they would say yes. 
the Arabs were offered more than 97%. So what, if it was 97.3, they would say, what, what, how can you say no to such a deal? So I've never heard of that. Second thing, I believe that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. I believe in freedom, so I cannot force anyone, but where do I want Jews to be? I want Jews to be in Israel. It makes me happy when more Jews are in Israel. Um, they're saying that they have a claim of return, so they want to create a state, allegedly create a state in Gaza and Judea and Samaria, but they want to send their people to Israel proper. That's like me saying I want Israel to be the nation instead of the Jewish people and send all the Jews to Turkey. How does that make any sense? If you want to create a state, you want to have citizens, right? Why are you creating a state and sending your citizens to someone else's state? To me, it sounds like they have a bigger desire for me to cease to exist. By the way, in Israel, you have full equal rights to everyone, Jews, Christians, Muslims, vegans, I don't care, everyone has, everyone has full equal rights. Under the PA, for those who do not know, you have two really annoying things. They have many annoying things. There's two really annoying things that I want to share with you. One is pay for slay. If you murder an Israeli and you sit in the Israeli prison, you would get five times more money than the average pay under the PA. It's an incentive to create terror. That's number one. Number two, if you sell your house to a Jew under the PA, it's a death sentence. So who are you progressive people who are supporting that? I really cannot understand. So basically they're saying we want a Jewish free area in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, and we want to send all the Arabs, the quote unquote refugees, to Tel Aviv. So why are you creating a country there? I mentioned before that the PLO was created in 1964. They have not altered their charter ever since. They want to annihilate the state of Israel. They don't want to create a state. Um, why aren't they actually creating a state? There's nothing that's stopping them. Under the Montevideo Convention, the four rules in order to have a state is you have to have population, you have to have territory, you have to have a government, and you have to have ties with other countries. The PA, the PA has more ties with other countries than Israel. The only thing that's stopping the PA from saying we want to create a state right now is themselves. They will not do it because if a PA leader, if Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, will do it right now, they will assassinate him in a second. Because that's, that's not the main goal. It's like having someone saying, I would rather stab both of my eyes as long as I can stab your, you in the eye. That's what I have right now as my neighbor. And I told you before about the money spent on terror. This is really interesting. I've heard. I've heard, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not supporting it, but I've heard of people using terror to achieve a political goal. I've never heard, only under the PA, of people using, using political uh, goals to create terror. That's the weirdest thing in the world. Again, I'm not supporting, but I know that throughout history, people use terror to achieve something in politics. The PA are using politics to achieve terror. Think of Hamas, the second wealthiest organization in the world. Hamas, for those who don't know, is a Sunni terrorist organization, also for some reason being sponsored by Iran. They're basically ISIS, only with worse PR. Same ideology. And Hamas is the second wealthiest terrorist organization in the world. And they have the political ability to create something politically. And they're taking all of the resources that they've gained by political means and using it for terror, I don't have that in the world. Again, terror for policies, I get it. Policies for terror is very, very strange. For these reasons, I do not recognize them as a nation. I call them Arabs. Every survey, when you ask Arabs in Judea and Samaria, and you ask them, what would you rather have, a PA citizenship or under Israel? Under Israel? They'll all say under Israel. And let me be clear, an Arab would have a much better life in Judea and Samaria than Gaza. And you'll have a much better life in Haifa, which is under Israel proper, than in Judea and Samaria. A Jew has zero security in Gaza, a little bit more security in Judea and Samaria, and a lot more security in Israel proper. So the more Israel sovereignty you have, the more prosperity, the more human rights, the more, the more security everyone has. And it's not PC to say, but that's the truth. That is the truth. I'll tell you something else. I think that the Arabs in Gaza would really prefer having Israeli martial law over what they have right now. They're being uh, under a Hamas terror regime. Can you imagine living under a regime that if you're being accused of talking to someone from, with Israel, which might make you a spy, you'll be dragged down the street uh, connected to a motorcycle until you die? 
It's like having a neighbor that has a mentality of, of 1,000 years backwards on how they see human values. I want to talk, I have more time, I want to talk about another uh, topic with you that was very heated. I don't know if you heard about it. It's called the nation state law. Again, I'm a strong supporter of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. And I just want to read with you the, the law briefly and see if there's anything that's problematic with it. I would argue there isn't. So I mentioned before that in Israel we don't have a constitution. If you remember, we have basic laws. What are basic laws? Every liberal democracy stands on three legs. It has the procedural aspect. It has the human rights aspect. And it has the identity of the state. In Israel, quite remarkably, we do not have the identity of the state until a few years ago. Procedural, OK, how the Knesset is divided, our parliament, how many judges do we have, and so on and so forth. Human rights, we had a big revolution in the mid-90s, OK. Identity, we do not have. So what does the law say? The law says basic principles. The land of Israel is the historical homeland of the Jewish people in which the state of Israel was established. Um, the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people in which it realizes its natural, cultural, religious, and historical right to self-determination. The exercise of the right of, to national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. And I'm trying to understand why that is so troubling to people. I want to just remind to the people in America, America is actually a very unique model, a brilliant model. It's a content-neutral state. Israel and America are both countries of immigrants. If you read, the, I'm sure people here have read the books of the Founding Fathers. They saw George Washington as Moses. They saw George III as Pharaoh crossing the Atlantic Ocean is as if it's departing from the, the Red Sea and so on and so forth. There's a lot of similarities. There's one thing that's very different. America is a country of immigrants who came to a new world. Israel is a country of immigrants who came home. I think um, Clause A and Clause B, I, I don't think people would argue, but people might say, well, why is it only for the Jewish people? Why is it unique for the Jewish people? And I have to make this clear, super clear. Nation states are the most common model in the world today. In the UN, you have 193 countries. The US is one model. Belgium, Switzerland, Canada is a second model. The rest of the world is nation states. Denmark is the nation state of the Danish people, and they have minorities. Spain is the nation state of the Spanish people, and they have minorities. Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, and we have minorities. The only issue I think is maybe because the country is called Israel and we are called Jews. You want to solve that? Stop calling us Jews, call us Israelites. I don't know, maybe that will solve the, the, the problem. Um, but it's remarkable because when you think about it, if you're an American Jew, and I think that American Jews have prospered in America beyond any other place in the world. But if you're an American Jew, you need to make a decision. You have two choices. Either you give up a little bit of your Jewish identity, or you give up a little bit of your American identity. And I'll give you one example for that, holidays. If you want to be an observant Jewish person, maintaining your Jewish tradition of celebrating Passover, Pesach, and celebrating Sukkot, then you have to take days off. But that's not recognized because America has separation of church and state. That's not recognized. In Israel, we don't only recognize the Jewish state, the Jewish, sorry, holidays. We recognize the Christian holidays. We recognize the Muslim holidays. We recognize all holidays for all minorities. In that sense, we're actually a lot more inclusive. So um, the, whole, the whole point of Clause C means that if the Bedouins in the Negev decide that they don't want to be a part of Israel, we're like, no, that's not how it works. The Negev is a part of Israel. You cannot take that from us. No one is talking about taking the rights of the individual. In Israel, every individual has the right to work in all professions, to own land, to vote for the parliament, to be a part of the parliament. Let's move on. State symbol, the name of the state is Israel. The flag is white with two light blue stripes uh, close to the edge, da 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 da. Not very, very interesting to me, but nothing very uh, problematic here. The state, um, the, the seven branches menorah. Uh, sorry? The state, oh, that's a great thing. Pastor Mark says the state capital is Jerusalem. You're right. You know why you're right, Pastor Mark? It's a problem because that law was already passed in the 70s. 
The only thing they did is use the exact same wording of something that was passed 50 years ago, and they just put it here. Why did they put it here? I don't know, but you cannot say it changes reality. It's a basic law in Israel. Jerusalem is the United Capital of Israel. That's, that's the way it is. Um, by the way, that was true before Israel was reestablished. I, I pray, you know, and I, I, I pray for Jerusalem. I eat bread, and I, when after, after that, when I say thank you, I pray for Jerusalem. That was true before Israel was reestablished, um, and so on and so forth. So actually, Pastor Mark is correct. It is a problem because it already exists. They just repeated it. Um, language. Hebrew is the state language in Spain. Spanish is a state language. In the UK, they speak English. In France, they speak French. In Israel, we speak Hebrew. You want to call the language Israeli? Call it Israeli, if that will solve the problem. Now, a lot of people are saying, hold on, but you have a 20% Arabic uh, minority. OK. By the way, we also have a 20% Russian-speaking minority. Does that mean that we should also include Russian as a nation? Like, how, how many official languages should we have? But just to make sure that everyone is calm, we said the following. The Arabic language has a special status in the state arrangements regarding the use of Arabic um, in, in state institutions or vice versa. Them uh, will be set by law. And lastly, we said nothing in this article, not, we, you don't need to say it, but just to make everyone calm, nothing in this article shall affect the status given to the Arabic language before this law came to force. I, I really cannot understand why people are uh, having a problem with this. In gathering of the exiles, in case people, I have a not hidden agenda. Again, I'm, I wish more Jews would come to Israel. The state shall be open for Jewish immigration and for the in gathering of the exiles. That's, I think that, that's why Israel was created, basically. Um, connection to the Jewish people. The state shall strive to ensure the safety of members of the Jewish people and its citizens who are in trouble and in captivity due to their Jewishness or due to their citizenship. I cannot think of anything that makes it more clear that it's not just for Jews, it's Jews and citizens. The state shall act in the diaspora to preserve the ties between the state members of the Jewish people. The state shall act to preserve the cultural, historical, and religious heritage of the Jewish people among Jews in the diaspora. And we're almost done. It's only 11 articles. We're at Article 7. Uh, the state views the development of Jewish settlements as a national value and shall act to encourage and promote its establishment and strengthening. This is very tricky. When it says settlement here, it's because of a language transition. The law does not, unfortunately for me, is not implemented in Judea and Samaria because no Israeli law is implemented in Judea and Samaria. Otherwise, it would be a part of proper Israel. When they say settlement, they mean the original meaning of settlement, a town. Israel is supporting creation of towns in Israel. Yes, that's why one of the reasons why you have governments. And I'm not a big fan of the governments. Um, official calendar. The Hebrew calendar is an official calendar of the state. And the Gregorian calendar shall serve alongside it as an official calendar. The use of the Hebrew calendar and the Gregorian calendar shall be determined by law. Independence Day, Memorial Day, days of, oh, this is interesting, days of rest and statutory holidays. The Sabbath and the Jewish holidays are the established days of rest in the state. Non-Jews have the right to observe the days of rest of their days of Sabbath and holidays. Details regarding this matter shall be determined by law. Again, for me, I'm like, yes, we are the nation instead of Jewish people. I like to have the Star of David on my, of my flag. I like to have Hebrew as my official language. It's the only place in the world where, where I can express my identity and feel connected to it. And I respect all the minorities. And I ask people, if I take Muhammad as an example, Muhammad would be an Israeli Arab Muslim. And I take Muhammad and I put Muhammad in Denmark and ask him, Muhammad, are you, are you happy in Denmark? So yeah. Do you know that there's a cross on the Danish flag? Yeah. Do you know that you know, in their anthem they have religious uh, aspects? Yeah. So why is it so problematic for you to be in Israel? Denmark has a queen, a Lutheran queen, has to send her kids to Lutheran education. 80% of the uh, people of Denmark belong to the Lutheran church of the state. How come Muhammad, who's an Arab Muslim, can be of uh, you know, living peacefully as a minority in Denmark, but when it comes to Israel, it's problematic. And if anything, it's the opposite, because in Israel, I give him a lot more individual freedoms that he will receive in Denmark, and the state will provide him a lot more than what he will receive in Denmark regarding holidays, regarding uh, the special status of the language, and so on and so forth. 
And lastly, the, uh, the basic law shall not be modified except by a basic law. All right. One last thing I want to talk to you about, because that was the original, uh, original uh, uh, point of this conversation or lecture. But um, I was going to talk a little bit about UNRWA. And I want to show you how there are forces in the world that are acting to promote a conflict. They have an interest for me to suffer, for the, the state of Israel to suffer. And I want to show you these two charts. Basically, for me, these two charts explain everything you need to know about UNRWA. The chart that you see marked in red, if you can see it, it goes up and down, represent every refugee crisis in the world. You had people living somewhere, something happened, an earthquake, war, and you had refugees. And what do refugees want to do? They want to resettle somewhere. They want to stay alive. One of my uh, grandparents, my grandma, may she rest in peace, she is a Holocaust survivor. She was in Auschwitz. She was a refugee. They wanted to murder her. They murdered all of her family. She escaped. She wanted to resettle. And thank God she settled in the land of Israel, which was the, the greatest uh, pride and joy that she had for the rest of her life, that she was in Israel. The other chart that we have is UNRWA. You had Arabs living in Israel, and you have more and more and more and more refugees. And it's just ballooning, which is very interesting. So UNRWA, which is the, um, UNRWA is, is the organization which is, by the way, unique by definition. Because one of the values of the United Nations is that it's supposed to treat all of the different members of it equally. But the Arabs of Judea, Samaria, and Gaza are always getting more allocations than any other group in the world. They have five different departments in the UN that have a PR stunt just for them. I'm including social media. I'm talking about budgets going to promote them. I want to give you one example, and then I'll go back to UNRWA. There is an organization that's supposed to deal with agriculture in Latin America. That organization has conferences against Israel. How how is that relevant? People work. They make money. They give their money to the government in different countries. The government gives that money to the UN. I'm personally against it, but that's what happens. The UN allocates that money to an organization that's supposed to help people with agriculture in Latin America. And then they have a conference against Israel. And then you wonder why so many people don't like Israel. It's because you have this organization that spends so much money on making people don't like. Back to UNRWA. I want to compare UNRWA to the uh, UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, it's different organizations. And let's see what's the difference between the two of them. They have a different definition for a refugee. They have a different mandate. They, they, they have a different staffing policy. The way that they allocate resources is different. UNRWA is linked to terror. UNRWA is an, 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 uh, an anomaly, anomaly, sorry, anomaly for the UN. And what is their ramification? So let's talk about the definition. For all of the refugees in the world, the definition of a refugee is someone that comes from a country or nationality, which is their natural habitat. For UNRWA, it's people who were here between 1946, June, to 1948, May. They're not indigenous. If you're narrowing it down to a few years, two and a half years, two years, if, if, sorry, two years, if you're narrowing it down to that, you cannot say you're indigenous if you're somewhere in, for, for that two years. It means someone could have visited his cousin in that time. But the interesting thing is they're descendants from the father's side. So you can be an American citizen and call yourself a refugee, which is mind-blowing. People who are not refugees sometimes try to become American citizen. There's a famous model, uh, the Hadid family, millionaire has more has like 45 million followers on Instagram which is like almost three times all of the Jews in the world uh, supermodel in America she's a refugee you can be a citizen of the UK have German citizenship adopt a kid from China and that kid would be considered to be a refugee that's not solving the problem that's making the problem always bigger because you're not trying to resettle because that's not part of your definition so while in the UNHCR, it declines over time, under UNRWA, it balloons over time, which means that you will never be able to solve it. So what is the mandate? UNRWA is responsible to work with one group of, uh, one group of people, which again is unlike any other groups. 
or organizations in the UN, and they're supposed to, provi to provide them with humanitarian assistance, while the UNHCR is supposed to give them permanent solutions, which is, again, what refugees usually want. They want to live. They don't want to die. Jews were also refugees. They ethnically cleansed Jews from the Arab and Muslim world. Before uh, Israel was reestablished, you had in Algeria so many and so many Jews, in Egypt, in Iraq, Lebanon, so on and so forth. Now you have almost zero Jews in all of these countries. If you want to talk about ethnic cleansing, Israel is really, really, really bad at ethnic cleansing. We're very good at startups. We're very, very bad at ethnic cleansing because the Arab population in Israel has grown tenfold. So when people are saying, oh, Israel is ethnically cleansing the Arabs, I'm like, we're doing a horrible job at it. <laughs> um, let's talk about the staffing policy. Now, you don't need to be, you don't need to be a, like, brilliant to understand how this works. When, when you're um, having 30,000 staff for 5.6 million people and all of the other refugees in the world, which is about 26.6 million people, and they have a smaller staff, it seems, to me, it seems a little bit strange. It seems like the UN has a different agenda, again, to not solve my conflict, to make my conflict always bigger. So this is how the refugee issue uh, grew. One of the most ridiculous issues about a refugee, so you know I, I mentioned before that there was a civil war in Syria, and Assad murdered half a million of his people. I can understand the concept of a Syrian refugee uh, you know, escaping to, uh, to Europe. I think a lot of people took advantage of it. But I can understand the situation of someone who's a refugee from that civil war. And I can understand that a Syrian person in Germany, he feels that he's in a different environment. He has different foods. He listens to a different language. It's a different um, weather. Some of the refugees, they're about a mile away from where they allegedly lived beforehand. So if someone lives in Bethlehem, a refugee camp in Bethlehem, when they, before that they argued that they lived in Jerusalem, I'm like, you can see your house. You're not a refugee. You just moved. You eat the same food. You have the same weather. Nothing has changed. You live in a different house. Get over it. You tried to murder us. You failed. I'm sorry. You're in the same area. The most ridiculous thing for me in that is the refugee camps under the PA. There are, there are by the way, Arabs who are suffering in refugee camps. They're suffering in Lebanon. No one is mentioning that. They're suffering in Jordan. No one is mentioning that. They're suffering in Egypt, in Syria, and so on and so forth. What does it mean to be a refugee under the PA? That, that's the state that you're pretending that you want to have. That's who you're controlling yourself. That's like me saying a Jewish person who wants to become a citizen of Israel is now a citizen of Israel and a refugee in Israel. How does it work? Your, your whole claim is that you have this, what I call fake identity, but you have this identity that you want to aspire, and you're under your own control. How can you be a refugee under the PA? All the PA has to do is say, you are under the PA. That's it. So that's UNRWA. Um, the definition plus the mandate means that basically it's an organization that is a problem. And it's causing a problem to Israel. This uh, an anomaly um, is very, very unique. It's the only UN agency whose uh, beneficiary population stems from one nation group. And they give the money to the people who are receiving the money. So the people who are receiving the money are the people who are giving the money. In addition to that, you have uh, a lot of links between UNRWA and terror. Unfortunately for me, I don't know if, uh, if you remember this, but I remember. Last time I was here, 10 years ago, I showed you, I carried with me, put my wallet in my bag. Um, I have a list with me of all the people I knew that were killed in terror attacks. Unfortunately, in the past decade, uh, that number has grown. And I know three people from my army unit. They're younger. They were in active service. And uh, three people were killed because UNRWA had uh, some sort of facility, but it was actually a Hamas, um, Hamas headquarter, and it collapsed, and the soldier was all booby-trapped. So there are a lot of links between UNRWA and terror. I'll just show you a few, uh, few examples. Um, I don't know if you can see it from there, but you can see different uh, tunnels in Bet Lechia. You can see different tunnels, uh, rocket launches from different UNRWA schools, uh, rocket launch from UNRWA health centers, and so on and so forth. And the picture that you can see, um, it's my bottom right, you can see the UNRWA uh, symbols in the terror tunnels that Hamas are building. 
It's not just that, it's also the incitement that they have. They teach in their schools anti-Semitic material. They're saying that Jews are descendants of apes and pigs. Jews should be killed, and the Holocaust did not happen. What do you think will happen from this? This is an obstacle to peace. Jews living in Judea is not an obstacle to peace. This is an obstacle to peace. Um, also, when we're talking about the treatment towards Israel, um, you have two pictures here. One is the original pe picture from the Syria crisis in 2014. And then, like they do very often, they take the same picture and then they say, this is what Israel is doing to the Arabs in Gaza. So I know that people lie. It's just really mind-blowing that the people who lie also are official UN workers. Um, my dream is that, and, and you know, again, this is what I think. I think the UN needs to be shut down completely. And the main way to do it is for Americans to not pay for the UN. If Americans would not pay for the UN, the UN will collapse. The UN will be meaningless. Right now in the, um, the Human Rights Council, all of the countries that are in charge of human rights have zero human rights. What makes the UN the UN is the support of America, the military support, and more important, the financial support. Again, I'm not an American citizen, but I think Americans need to worry about America, and they need to keep their dollars for themselves. Um, just to, uh, just to mention, I mentioned there are five different uh, organizations in the UN that what they do is PR for the UN, the DPPA, the DPA, SCD, CIRPP, all of these organizations, UNISPEL, obviously, all of these organizations are working um, to promote their cause. They're, they're working against Israel. This is the appendix per capita. <clears throat> One might say, well, you know, Juan, the Arabs of Judea and Samaria and Gaza are getting the most amount of money because they're, you know, they're, they're the poorest people in the world. Well, that's not the case. The, the UN knows it. It has a human development index. And you can see that there's no correlation. They're getting a lot of money when the UN is definitely saying they're not doing is the worst. They're getting more money than any other group in the world. I have more and more examples of all the resolutions against Israel and stuff like that. But I'm going to stop here because I do want to open it, if it's OK, by Pastor Mark for a few Q&A. We don't have a lot of time, but maybe just a few questions. brief description of, of the effectiveness of Lapid. I, I, I read some things about him today that were not very encouraging. Now he's he's driving the boat right now, right? Yes. Um, well, I am an Israeli citizen, so I'm allowed to give my opinion here. Um, I'm, I'm not very happy with the current prime minister. I'm not happy with the, the government at all. Um, we have elections soon. Um, Yair Lapid, well, to be honest, I didn't like him since I was 17. Um, no, he's, he's, a good, he's a good person, but I don't think that he sees uh, Israel the way I want to see it. I think he's taking a lot of risks right now. This is a, a period of time where we are about to have an election, and maybe he wants to gain some sort of political uh, benefits. But what really bothers me is not Yair Lapid himself. Again, he's a good person. I disagree with him politically. I'm right-wing, hawkish, conservative, free market, uh, uh, immigration limitation. That's who I am. He is the center. Remember when I said access, and if you don't have an opinion, you're in the center? I'm not making fun of him, but I will say this. His party, they had a website that was supposed to help you decide who you're going to choose. And they ask you questions. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? And at the end, they would tell you, you belong to this party. If you said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, you'll get Yair Lapid. <laughs> True story. True story. By the way, that's why a lot of people like him. He's very likable. He knows how to connect to people. He's a great speaker. He writes very well, but politically I disagree with him. But he's not my enemy. He's, he's, he's my, my fellow citizen, my prime minister, and I respect the establishment. I, I salute the rank, not the person, as they say. Um, but this current government, for me personally, um, was a stab in the back. Um, we have in Israel, in my mind, again, I know this sounds really, really strange because I'm super hawkish. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go to war like right now if they let me. Like I want to dance Samaria back. It's mine. I have nothing against Arabs. I have nothing, nothing. I'm not saying this. I'm not a PC guy. I have nothing against Arabs. I think Israeli Arab citizens are just like me. They can be in any party. They can be in the right-wing party, left-wing party. That will be a perfect world. Arab citizens are saying, I appreciate it, just like I think in America. People who come here should be like, they should be first and foremost Americans and say, I appreciate the country that enables me 
to live here as a free individual. That's remarkable. Half the world in, in, in the other side of the world has no liberty. Appreciate it. So again, I'm sorry, I just have to say, America is a miracle. People, anyway, so I think that's the same with, with the Israeli Arabs. That's not going to happen. OK, maybe not in the next five years. The second best thing would be to have an Arab party in the parliament that says, I'm supporting the government no matter what. I just want money. I'll use that money for better education. Like, OK, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to do that. That's great. You want to improve yourself. That's great. You know, win-win situation. I'll, I'll deal with it. Unfortunately, what I have right now is that the Arab members of Knesset, they hate Israel. I don't know how that would work in America. I know you have some, some politicians I'm not a big fan of in America. But, but they literally, they support terror. I'm not saying this you know, out of a thing. They meet with convicted terrorists. And they're getting my tax shekels uh, as their salary. So that's my problem. And they created a coalition with them. And for me, that was a stab in the back. Because that's really what was supposed to be. They, were not, they should not have been allowed to run. I, know, I don't know enough about American law, but I have a, a feeling that if someone was uh, involved in acts of terror in America, they would say, you cannot run for Congress. I'm assuming, I hope. Um, and in Israel, for some reason, I, you don't know. You don't know. I know what's happening in America now. The squad, who said that? Um, so, uh, so, so that's the problem. And who allowed them to run to the Knesset? The Supreme Court. Because according to the Israeli law, if you're supporting terror, if you're a racist, if you're against Israel as the nation instead of the Jewish people, you should not be a part of the parliament. The Supreme Court said, no, there are crimes. I have all the footage in the world. I'm not talking about 20 years. I'm talking about like last week. I'm talking about a guy that meets with the terrorists in Syria. You're not supposed to go to Syria. You're an Israeli. This is a, a country that we have a conflict with. You're not supposed to be in the parliament. And that's my problem. So when the, when the current government which was supposed to be a right-wing government, broke their, it's OK, all politicians break their promises. But when they joined forces with the far left, the Meretz party, you guys have the same, well, actually, you guys, not you guys specifically, but America creates a problem, and then it dripples down to Israel. OK, all of the, all of the weird, ludicrous progressiveness, eventually it comes down to Israel. Um, so we have these parties joining forces with Arab parties who are anti-Israel. And all of a sudden, they're working together with them. And that's my biggest problem with Yair Lapid right now. And I don't know what will happen. Because if we are unable to have another coalition, he's going to remain prime minister until we do. I don't mean to um, detract from what you're speaking about right now. But um, I just learned just yesterday about bioharvest and how there's a scientist who is talking about all these different um, harvesting things that they're doing from the red grape and how uh, it's called VINIA and how it is the solution to inflammation. Um, you touched on it briefly in the very beginning. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's a company called BioHarvest. And, and they're going to have a, a great impact on the pharmaceutical. So could you speak on that a little bit? or you don't? I'm not sure I have anything to contribute. I'm sorry. I, and I'm not sure I understood the question. I'm sorry. I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in the medical field. I know about, I, I teach Middle East. I teach political science. I have an MBA, MA in history, working on a PhD, law. I know nothing about biology. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get another degree until the next time. <laughs> We've had a couple of different speakers that were Israeli that um, talked about um, uh, Mr. Netanyahu and the tremendous impact obviously he's had over the many years, but he's, in that he's created a few enemies, to say the least. And so now you talk about this narrow coalition that he's trying to form. Um, do you think that, that he'll be back in power, that that's possible, that that would be the wrong thing to do? What is your opinion on that? So first of all, that's a great question. I think a lot of Israelis don't have the answer to that. I have a lot of appreciation towards Netanyahu. I also criticize Netanyahu. In Israel, that would put uh, me as a question mark for a lot of Israelis. Wait, is he right wing or left wing? Which is funny, because I'm, I'm very right. I, I, I don't think there's more right than me in Israel. And I don't represent the Israeli society. I wish I would. I don't. Um, Netanyahu has done amazing things for Israel. 
the Abraham Accords, the making us into a, a, a superpower of our region, and so on and so forth. I think he has more depth and knowledge than any other leader. But he's unable to create a coalition. And a lot of people from the right wanted to make sure that he's moving more to the right. So all of these parties said, we're going to be with Netanyahu in the coalition, and we're going to make sure that he builds the coalition with us. That was the, the new right party. I just have to be honest here. I ran with the previous prime minister, Bennett. Uh, today, I'm not so happy about it. But originally, Bennett said, told me, I don't want to share everything because it was a private conversation. But the, the whole point was for me to be with him, to tilt Netanyahu more to the right. Because if Netanyahu builds a coalition with, with the left-wing party, then he would not be able to promote a right-wing agenda. And a lot of people in the right felt like this. They said, OK, come on, let's do something that's more right-wing. And it didn't happen. But what we saw in this election, that the, the parties that said were more right-wing than Netanyahu, they built a, that's like imagining that you would vote for a president that says, I'm Republican, you know, with all of the, the values of the Republican Party. And then he only legislated laws with the squad. Th that's what happened to us. So, so me personally, I took a step backwards. I said, you know what? Maybe I don't understand everything. Politics is, um, is very interesting, um, <laughs> very, very messy. And uh, I don't think we're going to see us. Maybe I'm wrong. Again, I, I, I learned some to be more humble and modest with how I predict the future in this, because I realize that so many things can happen. And right now, it will have to be, an, I, maybe, again, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see how it's not a narrow coalition. And that narrow coalition would just means that a person like me that wants to have more free market, that wants to have more limitations on illegal, I don't know if I, there are many other topics I did not mention because we, we don't have that much time, but people who are also penetrating Israel illegally. Um, you have about 80,000 illegal people coming to Israel. They're not, they're not really um, focusing on thinking how much money they're going to make when they're creating their families. It can multiply to be half a million people. When you're 9 million, million people in a state and you have another half million minority, it's not like half a million in America. It's much more noticeable. That's an issue. And I have more and more of these things. And we're not going to be able to, to work with them. So yeah, I hope I gave you an answer. It was my most honest answer. Thank you. I know a situation during uh, right after the 67 war where there were some people who told me recently that before the war they had Jordanian passports and then after the war they were all revoked as they lived in Jerusalem and they were now called Palestinians. Yeah. It's the same thing in Gaza and Egypt. A lot of them, they just got their passports revoked. They couldn't go back home. And yeah. so in one sense, it's a tough situation. Yeah. I, I do acknowledge the fact, without a doubt, that Jews in Israel have a way better life than the Arabs who are living in Judea and Samaria and Gaza. I, I'm not arguing that that's not the case. I'm just arguing it's not because of me. It's because of them. That's my main argument. If someone would say, you know, you look at you, you have your high-tech uh, country. And, yeah, because we invest in life, and they invest in death. And I, I would love them to have a better life. Here's my solution. Live under my sovereignty. Excellent. Well, it's more a comment about, uh, I live in the state of Washington, which is known as God's country and also the Bolshevik state of Washington. So all the communist stuff is way deep here, and it's a whole lot more underground. But it, it's just as they're just as much a, against this country as it has been a Christian nation, as it works a hard press to do undermining every way it can in this country. So. Is the way it is. Yeah, true. I will say this. Um, you know, everything is relative, right? Like I told Einstein, no. um, everything is relative. And and am I a young person or an old person? Because on one hand, I'm like not that old, but I'm not that young anymore. And there is a problem with the next generation. Oh, definitely. There's a big problem with the next generation. I feel it. There's no way you cannot feel it. I also feel the people who are um, having less ties with Israel. I'm talking Jews and non-Jews having less ties to Israel. And I think that people sometimes forget that freedom is just one generation away from being taken away from them. Well, you, you have been, you can be, the eye-opener of this pandemic shows a whole American nation, a whole lot of, uh, of teaching of kids a whole lot of stuff. 
nobody in parenthood would want any of this stuff to go on. For sure. All right, uh, just one last comment. I don't know if you're aware of this, you're a historian, but uh, you're familiar with July 4th, 1776? Yes, I am. Do you know what day that was on the biblical calendar? No. 17th of Tammuz. Oh, nice. I did not know that. I did Look not know that. Look at big golden calf on Wall Street. I did Street. not know that. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. Okay, let's give him a big hand. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of you, uh, all of you live streaming as well. Uh, see you again this coming Shabbat. Amen. Bye-bye. Yeah, 17th of Tammuz.